Welcome back. I'm Dr. Dai, and we are going to start off by looking at kind of the broad strokes of sexual reproduction. Uh, we're going to look at life cycle types before we start digging into the actual steps of meiosis. Uh, all right, so sexual reproduction emerged early in the evolution of eukaryotic cells and is widely prevalent among eukaryotes, uh, demonstrating its evolutionary success. Uh, many animals rely solely on sexual reproduction, like us. Um, however, there are some recognized drawbacks to sexual reproduction. Um, specifically, like, genetically identical offspring can be advantageous if they're in a well-suited environment. So that's where things like asexual methods like budding and fragmentation offer a lot of benefits. Um, these approaches don't require finding a mate. Uh, they conserve energy for reproduction and some solitary organisms maintain an asexual reproduction capability. So we actually do see some organisms that can do both asexual and sexual reproduction, which is, which is great. Um, asexual populations consist solely of females. Um, allowing them to potentially grow twice as fast as sexual populations. Um, this gives them a competitive edge. Consequently, asexual reproduction, uh, it should be more common, right? You would think, yet exclusively asexual repro reproducing organisms that are multicellular are extremely rare. Uh, so why? Why is sexual reproduction so prevalent? And this is one of the key questions um, in biology with research that spans not just decades, but like centuries, really. Um, a probable explanation lies in the role of variation in offspring's survival um, and their ability to reproduce. So asexual organisms rely solely on mutation for variation. So mistakes, they're relying on mistakes. Whereas sexual organisms, sexually reproducing organisms, we're gonna draw traits from both parents to create these unique genomes. So each individual in a sexually reproducing population, except for twins, um, is gonna be a little different, even from their closest relatives. Um, so how do we do that? How do we produce these unique, uh, unique genomes? Meiosis is the answer. Um, so meiosis divides the nuclear content uh, and distributes chromosomes among the gametes. Um, it's gonna enhance variation. And we're gonna see there's some really cool steps that it goes through that allow for this, this really great variation. Um, fertilization then goes on to combine unique gametes uh, from two different individuals, right? Uh, creating additional opportunities for genetic diversity in the offspring of that individual. There are a few different uh, life cycle styles that sexually reproducing organisms can utilize, um, but they're all going to involve alternating between meiosis and fertilization with variation among the organisms. Um, meiosis reduces the number of chromosomes in the gametes, while fertilization then combines two haploid gametes to restore what we call a diploidy, having two copies. There are three primary life cycle categories that exist in multicellular organisms. Uh, diploid dominant. In this type, the multicellular diploid stage is predominant and there's no significant multicellular haploid stage. Most animals, including humans, follow this pattern. Um, gametes are the sole haploid cells and arise from a diploid germline cell um, with no further haploid cell stages. We have a haploid dominant. Um, this life cycle emphasizes the multicellular haploid stage with no conspicuous multicellular diploid stage. Um, this pattern is observed in fungi and some algae. Uh, it's not, not particularly common. And then we have something called alternation of generations. Here, both haploid and diploid stages are evident to varying degrees depending on the organism. Uh, plants and some algae are going to use this strategy. Uh, plants do some really interesting things, as we're going to see, especially when we start looking at some of the more uh, complex genetic things that plants are capable of doing. The alternate generations allows them to do this. All right, the majority of animals adopt a diploid dominant approach, right, animals, um, where haploid gametes are produced from that diploid germ cell, and then fertilization restores um, diploidy through the fusion of gametes with, from different individuals. Um, 
again, this is, we see this predominantly in animals, um, vertebrate and invertebrate. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that there are, there are, are other things that go on. All right. So in the life cycle of many fungi and algae, the main multicellular form of the organism is haploids, right? So this is one of those weird ones. Um, during sexual reproduction, specialized haploid cells form from two individuals and they unite to create a diploid zygote. Okay, that's how, that should sound somewhat familiar. Um, this zygote promptly undergoes meiosis. So meiosis happens after fusion of the gametes instead of before. Um, so this zygote is going to go through meiosis and it's going to yield four haploid spores, the term we use. And those four unique spores can now go on to fuse with other spores that they encounter and go through the process all over again. In the case of some algae and all plants, um, we're going to see this alternation of generations. Both haploid and diploid multicellular stages exist in their life cycles. Um, the haploid multicellular plants are known as gametophytes. Um, they're going to produce gametes without involving meiosis since they're already haploid. Fertil fertilization between these gametes form a diploid zygote, which through multiple rounds of mitosis develops into a diploid multicellular plant called a sporophyte. Um, and that's a specialized sporophyte cell will then undergo meiosis, generating haploid spores, which eventually develop into gametophytes, and the cycle can go on and on. All right, thank you for joining me in this little overview of sexual reproduction. Next time, we're going to dig into the specific steps of meiosis.